In this course, I hope to cover the atomic mechanisms of all of the major transformations that occur in steels, and at the same time explain how to use this kind of information in the design of novel alloys of iron. There is more information on this teaching website, and there is also a book um, which might contain more detail than you need for this particular course, but uh, you might find it useful. Now, the transformations um, can be described in two categories, the reconstructive transformations and the displacive transformations. Some of these you might already be familiar with, but we'll begin with martensitic transformation, which is diffusion-less and continue to higher, ever higher temperatures to cover the other displacive transformations. Uh, and basically a displacive transformation is one in which you, know, you homogeneously deform the parent lattice in order to produce the product lattice. And in doing so, there's no diffusion of atoms and there are consequences on the shape of the transformation product and on the energetics as, as we will see later. In a reconstructive transformation, on the other hand, uh, you know, you take the parent crystal structure, break all the bonds and rearrange the atoms into the new structure without causing a great deal of strains in the surrounding matrix. And uh, during the course of a reconstructive transformation, you could also get the partitioning of alloying elements which prefer to be in one phase or in the other. And reconstructive transformation include uh, allotriomorphic ferrite, adiomorphic ferrite, massive ferrite, and perlite, all of which uh, we will cover during the course of the lectures. But today I'm going to begin with uh, martensitic transformations, which probably represent the best understood of all the phase transformations in steels. And I normally begin this by reviewing what you actually know about martensitic transformations, you know, what comes to mind immediately when you think about martensite, in other words, a brainstorming session with students. But given that this is a video recording, uh, I'll put up some examples of what people immediately say when martensite comes to mind. So you expect martensite to be hard, and that it involves some sort of rapid quenching from a high temperature. The transformation product is in the form of plates or, or laths. So a plate is self-explanatory, but a, a lath would be something like a ruler, long along one direction, broad along the other, and very thin otherwise. Um, the transformation is displacive and will go into a bit more detail into what this actually means. Uh, there is a volume change and uh, martensite is brittle until it is tempered usually, uh, body-centered tetragonal, metastable, diffusionless, uh, and so on. Now some of these ideas which come from brainstorming about martensite are not quite correct. And some of them are not unique to martensite. So we'll go into, first of all, describing the characteristics of martensite and then continue to try and explain them. Now, a common, um, common misconception is that martensitic transformations generally occur at low temperatures and in mainly in iron alloys and that martensite is hard. So here is a, a list of martensitic transformations in a variety of materials. For example, here we have zirconia, uh, steels. This is a, a carbon-free alloy of iron and copper aluminum, argon nitrogen solid solutions. And you can see that the martensite start temperature can vary quite dramatically, but it can also be very, very low. The hardness uh, need not be high. You can see that this is a particularly hard martensite with its large carbon concentration. Uh, this is not so hard. 
and marriaging alloy which doesn't contain any carbon is not particularly hard. So it's really the carbon that makes martensite hard. If we get martensite in pure iron, which we can obtain by quenching at a very, very high rate, then that martensite is quite soft because the only additional strengthening comes from the last boundaries and the dislocation structures, which is by no means as large as the hardening caused by carbon in the body-centered cubic structure. And martensite, of course, need not be body-centered uh, tetragonal. If the carbon concentration is low enough, then we will get cubic martensite, and in pure iron, for example, or in marraging iron alloy, it will be cubic martensite. So the crystal structure really depends on what we are dealing with, um, and we can even get martensitic transformation in plutonium with a whole variety of uh, crystal structures. And you will see later that we also get martensitic transformations in polymers, in biological molecules, and so forth. So just to summarize, martensite can be found in many different materials. It is technologically of the greatest importance in steels by orders of magnitude compared with in any other material because it is so good at strengthening the steel uh, and you can control the strength by tempering reactions that you impose onto the martensite after it forms. We'll go into all that in a bit more detail later. Now one of the main characteristics that was completely missed out in the last slide is that the transformation is accompanied by a shape change. You know, if you deform the parent lattice in order to obtain the product lattice, then clearly the shape of the crystal will change if there is no diffusion allowed. Uh, and this example is actually of a virus here, where there is a, a cylinder here, which uh, operates as a hypodermic needle to inject a bacterium with the DNA from the virus, and then that can multiply inside the bacterium. So this cylinder actually starts off as long and thin, and then becomes short and fat, and in the process operates this hypodermic needle. Now that cylinder is a cylindrical crystal, in fact, and it is martensitic transformation of this cylindrical crystal that results in this short and fat version and operates the hypodermic needle. In other words, the shape deformation due to the martensitic transformation of this crystal actually helps to pierce the bacterium. And these are real pictures of the sort of viruses that uh, I was talking about on the surface of a bacterium. Okay, so. The point of this uh, slide was to show you that there is a shape deformation associated with martensitic transformation because obviously we have changed the pattern in which the atoms are arranged by a physical deformation rather than by breaking the bonds between the atoms uh, and rearranging them into a new configuration. So the shape deformation is extremely important when it comes to martensitic transformations and it dominates many of the features of the transformation. Now, you will have heard of shape memory metals, where here is a sample of a shape memory metal in a nickel titanium alloy, which uh, was first put into liquid nitrogen and it had a particular shape. Now it's put onto a hot plate and it turns into a different shape. And these forward and reverse shape changes are caused by martensitic transformation and the rearrangements of crystals inside that polycrystalline material. So cooling it again will give you a reversal of the shape deformation. Now, the key point is that you need to regard martensite as a combination of a crystal structure change and a deformation. A slip and twinning simply cause a deformation. They do not change the crystal structure. Martensitic transformation actually deforms 
and in the process the crystal structure changes. So you can regard martensite as a deformation mechanism and it turns out that that is a very important characteristic which is used in the design of extremely ductile steels we will see in a later lecture. Now we have uh, mentioned that martensitic transformation is diffusionless and why do we think it's diffusionless? Well it can form at incredibly low temperatures. So you saw that in one case, the Martin size start temperature was four Kelvin. And it is inconceivable that during the time scale of that experiment, you could have any diffusion at all of any of the atoms. Martin site can also form very rapidly. Um, it can form at a speed of about a thousand meters per second which is about a fifth of the re-entry speed of the space shuttle. So that's a really, really high speed. And the closest that a diffusional transformation comes to this is about 80 meters per second during very rapid solidification of a nickel uh, containing alloy. So obviously when you have a diffusional transformation, you require rearrangements of atoms which are uncoordinated. So it cannot possibly proceed at the same sort of velocity as a displacive transformation. Now, with both of these characteristics, yes, martensite can form at very low temperatures, but it can also form at temperatures as high as 1200 Kelvin or even higher in some materials. Uh, it can form very rapidly at a thousand meters per second, but it can also be quite slow the conditions are appropriate. If the driving force is very small, we can even watch the interface of martensite going forward and backwards. So these characteristics indicate to us that the, uh, the transformation is diffusionless. And of course, we can now measure the chemical composition of the parent and product phases at the interface on the finest conceivable resolution, that means atom by atom, using techniques such as the atom probe or very, very high resolution microanalysis on the transmission electron microscope. So we know for sure that it is a diffusion-less transformation. Now, this is a, a nice uh, optical micrograph. Uh, if you look at the scale here, this is an optical micrograph illustrating the shape of martensite. Now the obvious conclusion to jump from this is that these are actually needles of martensite inside the matrix of austenite here. But you would be wrong because you're looking at two-dimensional sections. These are plates in three dimensions. Uh, you, can, you can prove that by looking at the plates on a two-surface analysis. So you metallographically polished two surfaces sharing a common edge and then you can see that the actual three-dimensional shape is plate-like. Indeed if it was needle-like you'd see lots and lots of uh, elliptical or round sections which you never do. So martensite is definitely in the form of a plate and this is not the thickness of the plate because there are stereological effects you know it depends on your plane of sectioning. The plate is actually much thinner than it appears here. Uh, typically, the thickness, uh, thickness to length ratio is of the order of 0 0.05. In other words, it's uh, uh, 20 times longer than uh, it is thick. Okay, now we need to understand why the martensite forms in the form of thin plates. Uh, well, you know, if you take a single crystal of austenite here and we only have air surrounding it. In other words, it's an, uh, it's, uh, an unconstrained transformation. When it transforms, you will get a shape deformation that looks like this uh, because uh, it's, it is unconstrained. So the strain energy is basically zero due to the transformation. It's happening against air, which is a fluid. However, if this crystal is surrounded by many other crystals, then we call this a constrained transformation. 
And in this case, it forms as a thin plate, okay? Uh, and we will demonstrate later that a thin plate minimizes the strain energy due to the shape change, okay? Thinner the plate, the smaller the strain energy, but the less transformation you get. So there is a compromise in balancing the chemical free energy change against the strain energy of transformation. Now, if we look at the image of Martin site, it seems to form on particular crystallographic planes. So for example, this plate has the same uh, crystallographic plane with the parent phase as this one and so on. So we call the plane that the plate shares with the Martin site, the habit plane. So here is the habit plane, the interface between the Martin site and the austenite. But when the transformation is constrained, the plate is in the form of a lens-like object. And it is this average plane that we call the habit plane. And it's crystallographically identical to this one. And I'll show you now a list of these habit planes. And they vary quite widely from close to 111 gamma, 295 gamma, 315, 10, 215, 2, and bear in mind that these are approximate habit plane indices. The actual habit plane is irrational. What does that mean? That means that I can't express it as a set of integers. It may be close to 111, but it's not exactly 111 for some peculiar reason. And for another peculiar reason, it can have these kinds of strange indices which don't happen in slip and twinning. You know, we get slip on close back planes and close back directions and similarly for twinning. So something very strange about the habit plane of Martin side, that it is irrational. And I mentioned that we need to explain uh, the shape of the Martin side. Uh, and we'll do that uh, as soon as we are able to calculate the strain energy of transformation. Now, given that you produce the structure of martensite by a deformation of the austenite, the parent phase, we expect a close crystallographic relationship between the austenite and the martensite. And that relationship should be reproducible uh, because the plates are all forming, each one of these plates is forming by the same mechanism. And indeed, uh, when we measure the orientation between the martensite and the austenite, it is highly reproducible, okay? So I'm going to give you two examples of orientation relationships, which are described a lot in the literature. So here, for example, is what's known as the nishiyama Wasserman orientation relationship, where we have the close back plane of austenite exactly parallel to the most densely packed plane of ferrite in the middle here. And the corresponding close back directions in these planes are nearly parallel, 5.26 degrees apart. Now, this diagram is interesting because uh, this shows you two austenite unit cells and a unit cell of the martensite. And here you can see that I've drawn it so that these directions are exactly parallel, 0, 0, 001 gamma and 0, 0, 001 alpha. And this direction here is uh, of the Martin side is parallel to a 110 type direction of the austenite and similarly here. And the significance of this diagram is that I can deform this austenite by a compression along the vertical axis and an expansion along the other two axes to produce my martensite lattice. So this is known as the Bain strain and this orientation relationship is known as the Bain orientation. Now, if I look on the stereographic projection to see where I can find this orientation, then these are the 001 directions of the austenite and of the martensite. And they're not exactly parallel, but they are close to being what's illustrated in this diagram. And similarly here, I have the 
one zero zero of the martensite, roughly parallel to the one bar one zero of the austenite, and the zero one zero of the martensite, roughly parallel to the one one zero of the austenite. So we can we can discover this orientation relationship uh, in this uh, Nishiyama Vasaman uh, orientation. But it's approximate here, okay? It's not, not exact. The second one uh, is known as the Kojimo Sachs orientation, which is closely related to Nishiyama Vasaman. Uh, this is still Nishiyama Vasaman, and I'm going to show you how closely related they are by playing, the, playing this movie. So, what's, what we are going to do is to rotate by 5.26 degrees relative to the Nishiyama Vasaman orientation. And these become exactly coincident, that angle becomes 10.51. So these two orientation relationships, relationships are not that different, okay? And again, once again, in the middle, you can see the Bain type orientation, but not exactly. In fact, even the Kojimo Sachs and the Nishiyama Vasaman orientations are approximate because these are not exactly parallel when you do very accurate measurements. The real orientation relationship is, um, is um, irrational. Okay? So this is the exact orientation relationship. Uh, neither Kojimo Sachs nor Nishiyama Vasman follow this, they are, they are deviated from that. And even the Kojima Sachs and Nishiyama Vasman and any other uh, sort of stated orientation is only approximate because the true orientation relationship is irrational. We've got to be able to explain this. The transformation is also known to be athermal. A thermal means that if I have an equation here for the volume fraction of martensite as a function of temperature below the martensite start temperature. So when you cool austenite, there's a certain temperature called the MS temperature, martensite start temperature, where martensite is first triggered. Uh, and as you undercool below that, you get an increase in the volume fraction, but you don't get an increase if you hold at that undercooling for any length of time. So when I cool the uh, austenite, avoiding all the other transformations, at this temperature below MS, I get just 1% of martensite. In order to get more, I need to cool further, 50% and 95%. Uh, so this kind of a transformation is known as a-thermal. And uh, the reason why this happens is that the nucleation of martensite occurs on defects, and some defects are more potent than others. So some of them are activated to nucleate at a temperature of MS, and the easy ones are then exhausted. So you have to cool further in order to get more transformation, and even further to get the, you know, the least effective uh, defects helping martensite to nucleate. Now, this, this diagram of a-thermal transformation of martensite is valid for the thousands and thousands of steels that we ordinarily use, okay? But bear in mind that we have pictures which we have already seen where the martensite and austenite coexist. And that means that this is a thermodynamically first order transformation which must involve nucleation and growth. And, you know, if you think about the growth of a martensite plate, even though it may be growing at a thousand meters per second, if you had a camera that was fast enough, you could record its growth isothermally. The reason why we don't uh, see a time dependence here, you know, even if uh, we are working with a limited set of nuclei, there will be growth of individual plates. The reason why we don't see that is because for the vast majority of steels, the transformations are so fast that you don't pick up a time dependence. You simply pick up the point where the transformation nuclei are exhausted for that particular temperature, okay? 
now. Uh, many, many years ago, Kojimo and Maximova in Russia demonstrated that you can actually get isothermal martensite in heavily alloyed uh, steels. So here we have 24 nickel, three manganese, and so forth, where the martensite start temperature is very low, okay, well below um, zero degrees centigrade. And then if you supercool the austenite to this temperature, it will take some time before martensite starts, and then you can pick up its transformation progressively, isothermally. Okay. So the reason why you can do that here is that these temperatures are very low. So even martensitic transformation requires some assistance from thermal activation when you are at very low temperatures, and therefore the progress of the plate of martensite becomes slower. And this is the classical C curve because the role of thermal activation diminishes as you go down in temperature, whereas the driving force for transformation increases. Notice also that I could actually quench this sufficiently rapidly to actually retain all of the austenite. And then when I warm that austenite up, I might get more, I might get more dyslexic transformation. So this is no different from an ordinary time temperature transformation diagram. So it's possible to get both a-thermal and isothermal martensite in steels. It simply depends on the rate of transformation and whether you are at a low enough temperature for thermal activation to be a kind of a limiting factor. Okay. Now, since this original work in Russia, there, there are many, many uh, alloys in which isothermal martensite has been discovered. Now, given that martensite can form extremely rapid and at low temperatures, it must have a very special interface. Okay? And just to remind you what we mean by an interface, I'm going to start with a single crystal and create an interface. So imagine that we have this uh, single crystal here, and I want to create a bicrystal, then I would cut it along the center and tilt the two halves with respect to each other. Now, unfortunately, this does not look like a boundary which is a planar defect, okay? We have actually created some empty space here, and that empty space is filled by extra half planes of dislocations which you put into the boundary, okay? So here is an array of dislocations where these extra half planes effectively fill up the space created by tilting the two halves with respect to each other, and the spacing of these dislocations is a function of the misorientation between these two. So if you look by transmission electron microscopy, the interface will consist of a periodic array of dislocations. Okay, so you can actually see them, you can characterize their line vectors and their Burgers vectors by doing certain analyses of contrast in the transmission electron microscope. B is, a, is the Burgers vectors of of Burgers vector of each of these dislocations. Okay, so an interface will consist of dislocations, but what is special about martensite? Um, well, um, sorry, this is just telling you the relationship between the spacing of the dislocations, the angle theta, and so on. This is a simplistic example for martensitic transformations because here we are not dealing with two different kinds of crystals. But in modern side, of course, we have to think about an interface interface, okay? But that is uh, not detail we need to go into. The detail that we do need is that the interface must be capable of moving without diffusion. So an interface which can move without diffusion is known as glissal. Just as we have a glissal dislocation, which can glide under the influence of uh, shear stress, and the sessile dislocation is one which is so strongly pinned that it simply cannot move even if you apply stress. Given that the interface consists of an array of dislocations, 
these dislocations must be able to glide neatly without any need for diffusion if, if they are to be associated with myotensitic transformation. If the Burgers vector of these dislocations lies outside the plane of the boundary, and these are edge dislocations, or if they are screw dislocations, then obviously the Burgers vector would lie in the plane of the boundary. If that is the case, then this can move without diffusion. And as they move, they will deform the crystal on this side into the crystal on this side. In contrast, this kind of an interface would not be acceptable because these dislocations require climb in order to move. And climb requires diffusion. And when diffusion happens, uh, it happens in a way that cancels out strain energy. So it's almost like fluid flow. So when this interface moves, you do not see a change in the shape of the parent crystal. Now I'll illustrate that with this movie. So here we have a glissile interface and um, the dislocations in that interface have the Burgers vectors pointing out of the plane of the interface here. And what happens is when that interface is translated towards the right, uh, this crystal grows at the expense of this, and therefore the overall shape of the pi crystal changes. So this, this was the shape of the original crystal, and we've changed that by moving the glissile interface. Contrast that with the motion of a sessile interface towards the right. Yes, we changed the structure, but the overall shape is completely unchanged because you know if diffusion happens, then the atoms can move in a way which will avoid any shape, unnecessary shape change when the crystals are surrounded by so many other crystals in a typical polycrystalline material. Okay, so we've discuss the structure of an interface in terms of dislocations. And in general, for a general interface, you'd require three independent sets of dislocations to completely accommodate the fit between the two abutting crystals. Okay. So let's just think about that a bit more. So you looked at it in a transmission electron microscope, you would see three arrays of dislocations in general. Now, obviously, when the interface translates, these dislocations might interfere with each other. And to illustrate that, here we have an edge dislocation and a screw dislocations. When they intersect, the screw dislocation acquires a line vector along the Burgers vector of the edge dislocation. And the edge dislocation um, acquires a segment which is parallel uh, to the Burgers vector of the screw dislocation and equal in magnitude to the Burgers vector here. So the screw dislocation was glissile on many different planes containing its line vector. But this component now is an edge component and therefore it cannot move as easily. So this dislocation becomes pinned. And similarly, there might be constraints on this part of the dislocation. The Burgers vector is constant everywhere, it's this, okay? But this is no longer a pure edge here. And it may not actually be glissile in the plane of this line vector, okay? In the plane containing this line vector and this Burgers vector. So it is possible that when dislocations intersect, you render them sessile even though individually they are glissile. And that's again illustrated on this uh, movie, where I start with a pair of screw dislocations this time. Burgers vectors are parallel to the line vectors and then cause them to intersect. And the resultant of that intersection is that the black dislocation acquires a step in the direction of the Burgers vector of the red dislocation and vice versa. And therefore, there no longer are screw dislocations in, in, in this region. And therefore, they may not be glissile. 
So the conclusion from this is that we cannot tolerate more than one array of dislocations in the interface between martensite and austenite because multiple arrays would interfere with each other and render the interface sessile. So the condition is twofold that the interface must be glissile, that means the Burgers vector of the dislocation must point out of the plane of the boundary, and also we cannot have more than one set of dislocations. So just to summarize, a glissile interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations. Otherwise, they would interfere and render each, uh, become sessile. Now, this leads to a very powerful conclusion that martensitic transformation is possible only if the deformation which carries the parent into the product leaves one line completely undistorted and unrotated. That means completely coherent between the parent and product phases. And we call this an invariant line. Uh, and therefore, the deformation that takes the austenite to the martensite lattice is, has to be an invariant line strain. That means it must be able to leave one line completely undistorted and unrotated. Otherwise, you cannot get martensitic transformation unless the interface is completely coherent, which is quite rare. Of course, if you have a completely coherent interface, you have an invariant plane with an infinite number of invariant lines. So that's also consistent with, with this uh, definition. The important thing, the important conclusion is that if you cannot find a homogeneous deformation that changes the parent lattice into that of the product and leaves a line completely invariant, it is not possible to get martensite. So tomorrow, if I asked you to tell me whether it's possible to get martensitic transformation between face-centered cubic nickel and monoclinic nickel, you could do that. You could, you could try and see whether it's possible to find a deformation which will leave a line invariant between those two. And if you manage to find such a line, and there are techniques for doing that, then it would be possible in principle. Whether or not it occurs depends also on the free energies of the different forms of the crystal structures. So there is, for example, uh, I, I was just uh, mentioning monoclinic nickel, doesn't exist, but we can do a calculation easily of the stability of that crystal structure using first principles, and then speculate as to whether we could produce martensitic transformation between those two. Or more generally, if you're looking at other alloys which do exist, uh, such as uh, in uranium, we get many different crystal structures, we can work out whether or not martensitic transformation is possible between the different allotropic forms. Okay, now imagine, uh, given this information, imagine that we are looking at the plan view of the interface. That means if this is the interface, we are looking uh, from a direction normal to that plane. So this is the plan view. And what we would see would be an array of dislocations that lie along this invariant line. And because this line is completely coherent between the two crystals, there's no need to have any other dislocations to accommodate the misfit along that direction. If we did not have an invariant line, you could not accommodate the misfit between the two with a single set of dislocations. Now, this means that the interfacial energy per unit area will be quite small because there's only one set of dislocations with coherent patches between, between these lines of dislocations. If you look at typical values, this is 0 0.2 joules per meter squared, which is identical um, roughly to the interfacial energy of twins. And twins can have fully coherent interfaces. So that's, that's to be regarded as a low interfacial energy. And that is a general incoherent boundary. Um, 
which has lots of free space within it. And this is the surface energy of window glass, for example. So this interface has a high level of coherency, and that's what enables it to move so rapidly if necessary. Now, these are the two crystal structures that we are most interested in steels. This is the base center cubic or cubic F crystal structure of austenite, and the body center cubic or cubic I crystal structure of martensite. And of course, we can make this tetragonal if we put in sufficient carbon. And I need to find a deformation which changes this into this uh, without any breaking of bonds. Now, just to show you that it's possible to do that, supposing we have a square lattice here, okay? I can, I can deform that into a different crystal structure without breaking any of the bonds, okay? So here, this is a homogeneous uh, shear deformation that I've applied, and we now have a new lattice, okay? Um, it, uh, it has this, uh, this uh, shape as opposed to the square pattern. And notice also that the macroscopic shape of the crystal must necessarily change in a way consistent with the atomic patterns of the parent and product crystals. I'm now going to show you quite a nice uh, I'm now going to show you quite a nice uh, movie which was made in Germany using a hot stage optical microscope. So this is a special microscope with a long focal length uh, lens uh, to look at a specimen that is located inside this furnace. And the specimen is uh, metallographically polished but not etched when placed in the furnace. Vacuum is created and the sample is heated into the austenite temperature range. Uh, it's still flat, but you develop thermal grooves at the positions of the austenite grain boundaries. When the sample is cooled, you can see the development of the martensitic transformation without any etching because of the displacements that are caused when martensite forms. Unter einem Mikroskop mit einer Heiz- und Kühlvorrichtung kann die Schliffoberfläche während der Abkühlung beobachtet werden. Die Macht in Sitzbildung wird in der polierten Oberfläche durch eine nadelförmige Deformation sichtbar. Bei 830 Grad Celsius sind von Austenit lediglich die Korngrenzen zu sehen. Dieses Bild ändert sich mit der jetzt einsetzenden Abkühlung so lange nicht, bis die Temperatur des Beginns der Macht in Sitzbildung bei 360 Grad Celsius unterschritten wird. Man erkennt kein Wachsen der Nadeln. Hier eine Übersichtsaufnahme. Die einzelnen Platten entstehen etwa mit Schallgeschwindigkeit. Die macht den Sitzmenge nimmt nur mit sinkender Temperatur zu. So more than anything else, what this uh, demonstrates so vividly is that martensitic transformation should be regarded as a deformation accompanied by a crystal structure change and just like a slip system has a slip plane and a slip direction, the martensite has a, a habit plane on which the deformation happens and a displacement direction, which is not quite parallel to the habit plane because there's also a volume change. Now, these shape deformations uh, are quite large. And if they are elastically accommodated, that means the strains that are caused in the surroundings are purely elastic, then the interface between the austenite and martensite is reversible. But if, if the strains cause plasticity in the adjacent austenite, introduce defects and so on, then obviously a glissile interface will tend to be retarded by those uh, dislocations or even pinned by any hindrances uh, in, in its path. And therefore, reversibility becomes uh, impossible uh, without uh, excessive heating. Now, in some martensitic transformations, for reasons uh, I won't discuss, the plates are elastically accommodated. So when we raise the temperature, 
the transformation will reverse. You'll see the interface is moving backwards. So this is a movie provided for me by colleagues from Hungary. And what you will see is, uh, first of all, we will see the shape deformations of various martensite plates. And as the material is heated, the interfaces reverse and the deformations disappear. So this is in a copper aluminum alloy, but it also, uh, uh, there are also movies on my website of similar things happening with the iron alloys. So these lines, these scratches were deflected by the transformation. They will become straight after all the shape changes have disappeared. So it's really quite remarkable in a space of a few degrees of heating, uh, the interface has completely reversed and we've recovered the original structure. So this is the beauty of the glissal interface. As long as you don't have obstructions in its path, it can go forwards and backwards uh, for many uh, cycles. Depending, uh, the number of cycles is decided by the accumulation of defects, which is inevitable over the long, long term. Okay. We can measure these shape deformations in a variety of ways, for example, by the deflection of scratches, by using optical interference microscopy, or using the atomic force microscope or scanning tunneling microscope to look at the surface topography and the crystallography underneath. I want to explain to you in some detail of the nature of the shape change accompanying martensitic transformations. This is a uniaxial dilatation, which is normal to this plane. Uh, so if you start with austenite like this and there's a zero Poisson's ratio, I pull it along here, uh, then I will get a volume change. But this plane is unchanged. It's unrotated and undistorted. So we have uniaxial dilatation. And this plane is known as an invariant plane, fully coherent. Similarly, uh, if we shear the blue crystal, then it also leaves this plane completely unchanged and that is also an invariant plane strain because that plane is undistorted and unrotated. If we combine these two then I get the most general kind of uh, invariant plane strain where we have a combination of a shear and a dilatation and this represents the displacement vector. I've exaggerated uh, the magnitude of delta over here uh, but this displacement vector is almost parallel to the habit plane, which is left unchanged. So what this indicates, okay, and bear this in mind, what this indicates is that the measurement of the shape deformation gives us a clue that the deformation in going from austenite to martensite is an invariant plane strain. So the condition for an invariant line is satisfied, uh, but the shape deformation by itself indicates that the homogeneous strain which carries austenite into martensite is an invariant plane strain. And you'll see that this is actually not the case. Uh, and this is another one of the puzzles I wanted to go away with, that the shape deformation indicates that you can change the austenite into martensite by a shear plus a volume change, where uh, leaving a plane completely coherent Whereas I will prove to you later in, a, in the next lecture that that is not possible. Now, given the magnitudes of these strains, you know, if you compare this against a typical elastic strain, which is about 10 to the minus three, then these are very large and these are plastic deformations. There will be a lot of strain created in the surroundings of the martensite plate, and that is a cost. Uh, a, a strain energy per unit volume. And we'll call that strain energy per unit volume capital E. And supposing that I just take a cube and I shear it, okay? It's a shear stress and the shear strain. Then the strain energy per unit volume is this blue area, which is half tau times gamma, which is, uh, you know, if I replace tau by the shear modulus and gamma, then this is the strain energy per unit volume, half mu times gamma squared. 
Now with Martinsite, we have a plastic strain as opposed to an elastic, so the half, half will not be there because this curve will be like a flat line. Okay, so we expect the strain energy per unit volume to vary with the shear modulus and with the shear strain squared. Okay, so bear that in mind. Now, this is an equation that, uh, uh, a simplified form of an equation that Christian derived back in 1957, <coughs> where you discover the same form here that we have the strains squared and the shear modulus mu. But there is an additional term here, which is the thickness divided by the length of the Martinside plate. We call this the aspect ratio. And I think I mentioned that it's typically 0 0.05. To understand where this comes from requires Ashelby's elastic theory, which is too complicated to cover in this lecture or in this whole series of lectures. But I'm going to show you some sort of physical reasoning for this behavior. So if you focus on this diagram here, uh, the displacement vector is this, okay? So the magnitude of the displacement as opposed to the strain increases as I move away from the habit plane because look here, the displacement vector is actually quite small. It becomes larger and larger as I move away from the habit plane. The strain is actually the displacement divided by the height, so that remains constant. But the amount that the Martinsite is pushing against, the magnitude of the amount the Martinsite is pushing against the surroundings increases as you go away from the habit plane. So there is a big advantage in making the Martinsite a thin plate because if it is shaped like a lens with sharp tips, then the displacement at the tip is very, very small, okay? So this helps to minimize the strain and cheaper unit volume. And therefore, Martinsite is in the form of a thin plate, okay? So that's a very important conclusion just by looking at a simple consideration of um, strain energy per unit volume. Now, of course, the Martin side, if it becomes even thinner, then there would be uh, less strain energy. But you have to think about the fact that we want to achieve transformation. So the actual thickness is determined by balancing the chemical driving force, which is the difference in the free energy between the austenite and the Martin side, and the strain energy per unit volume. So, let me now finish by summarizing some of the things we have learned. Uh, we haven't explained at all why we get strange habit planes, which are irrational indices, uh, close to, for example, 3, 10, 15, which in itself is very odd. Uh, we haven't explained uh, why we get irrational orientation relationship, where the close back planes are not quite parallel, okay? Uh, you know, just thinking about shear deformation and so on, we expect nice, neat planes. And we've discovered experimentally that the shape deformation is an invariant plane strain, leaving one plane completely coherent. Uh, but I will demonstrate to you in the next lecture that that's not possible. If I apply the observed shape deformation to the austenite, it gives me the wrong crystal structure. So I'll finish the talk uh, here and we'll continue in the next lecture. Thank you.